welcome to you all. Um, it is a great pleasure to have you here in Austin for this, the first day of Consensus 2022, and you can't understand how thrilled we are after a three-year hiatus of having everybody back together here once again. So, first of all, I'd like to see a show of hands. How many people here, this is your first consensus? Very good. Okay, that's what I was hoping for, because today's proceedings, this is the first day, as you know, of a four-day event, uh, Money Reimagined Summit, is really tailored for people who are on the start of their journey, particularly financial professionals who are looking at what investment opportunities are like. But of course, we are going to always, always welcome the OGs. You're always welcome in these stages. We'll be asking lots of really complicated questions about what all this means for investing. Uh, but if you are here from an institution, a firm, you're one of those suits, and you're thinking that all you're going to be doing is actually mingling with your fellow suits, well, I'm going to tell you, you're missing out big time if you don't take advantage of everything else that's going to be happening at Consensus the next three days. When we open at the Austin Convention Center tomorrow, we'll have 23 stages covering everything from NFTs to DAOs to protocol development to Bitcoin activism. And, and that's really where you're going to get the magic, right? It's a chance for the suits to meet the hoodies. Because the gathering of minds that happens at, at Consensus is where the magic happens. Consensus has been around for seven years. And it's always been the big tent event. We're proud of the fact that this is the place where entrepreneurs, investors, developers, academics, creators, regulators, policymakers, and everybody in between gathers to discuss, debate, and determine the direction of the decentralized economy. Now, we don't know exactly where that decentralized economy is going, but we do know that this technology is going to play a fundamental role in that. Essentially, you know, it could be central banks, it could be CBDCs, governments who are dictating where this goes, or it could be something radical like some of the new governance models that are being developed around DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations. But the point is that the issues that are being discussed here at Consensus and have been for years will di dictate where all of this is going, and this is your chance to participate in all of that. However, I understand at this current moment in time, if you're looking at some sort of more mundane, immediate concerns like your portfolios, which probably aren't looking quite as healthy as they did a few months ago. So it's okay. You can be obsessed with some of these issues, and that's going to be a key talking point for us here today. And unfortunately, it is the rather negative macro backdrop that's going to frame everything that we talk about. Of course, we've got inflation back after three decades. We have a pandemic that has not only killed millions of people, but has caused one of the weirdest, most distorted economies we've ever seen. Of course, we have this horrible war in Eastern Europe, which is causing massive heartache, but also driving up commodity prices and creating food shortages. And these are just the most immediate crises. We've got some long-standing ones, like the climate crisis. It seems to be just getting worse. And in the midst of all this, there's waning confidence in our institutions, particularly among young people. And at the same time, new technologies, specifically cryptocurrencies and blockchain technology, which will allow individuals, companies, and even governments to bypass those institutions. So it's really quite a transformative moment that we're in. And, you know, the Fed is raising rates, markets have tanked, but so too have crypto markets. We've had some spectacular failures in this. So the question is, like, is this... The death knell? Are we, are we sitting here thinking, really, th all of this was worth nothing? This massive amount of energy and, and development of this incredible technology, is the promise of its transformation actually false? I'm going to suggest no, of course. Uh, because in reality, if you think about what we're facing, the challenges to our institutions, the lack of confidence, it's the time for change, right? It's the time for something, a different system for how we manage and how we survive in the 21st century, where we're already living in a much more decentralized world. But of course, the adoption of crypto has never been a particularly smooth process. Those of you who've been in this space for, for a while will know that the volatility that we're seeing now is something that we've seen over and over again. And part of that's because it really doesn't fit the existing paradigm. 
right? It's, it's, a, it, it's a model for how we move money and value around the world that is quite different from the centralized structures that we currently have. And that inevitably creates tension and creates some challenges. But there really is a huge opportunity here. This is a moment in which uh, anybody who has explored what's happening in the development of this space can really take advantage of building through this, this quiet period. This is the moment in which we talk about biddling, B-U-D-L, to play on HODL, which you probably heard about, the time to actually develop things. So with all that in mind, for those of you who are in the investment community, uh, the questions are, what should you do? Should you invest? If so, how and when? And how might this rapidly changing technology help to reimagine our system of money, finance, and investing? What is the right policy framework? So these are the questions we'll be asking today. But before we start asking them of the incredible lineup of the speakers that we have, I want to quickly thank some of the people for whom this summit would not have been possible. First of all, a big shout out to our sponsors, especially Galaxy Digital, who are sponsoring today's Money Reimagined Summit. I'd also like to thank all of you for turning up and for trusting us with this event. Um, and I would most like to thank our amazing speaker lineup and, of course, the Coindesk staff and team who have worked tirelessly to bring this together. Now, a little bit of housekeeping. This is being live streamed, this event. So just so you know, this, this will be live streamed. Uh, and I encourage you all to uh, go downstairs at some point to the fourth floor and visit our sponsor booths. So without further ado, though, let's kick off the show. We're going to welcome commission, the, the chairman, the uh, Commission for Futures Trading, uh, the, sorry, Commodities Futures Trading Commission chairman, Rustin Benham, and former CFTC commissioner, Dawn Stump, to explore what the CFT's, CFTC's vision for uh, this technology is. Please welcome them. Well, thank you so much for coming here. Yeah, it's good this, to be here. Uh, it's good crowd. Know, nice spring weather we're having in Austin. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think that it, it'd be worth just kicking this off for those of the audience who don't know that much about what the CFTC does. Um, Chairman Benham, you could maybe just level set and give us uh, some stage setting about what the CFTC is all about and what its role in crypto has been. Yeah, and then I'm going to ask Don to correct me where I get it wrong. <laughs> but, uh, you know, derivatives regulator, we, we've... Uh, we have an interesting history. Uh, we've been around a long time. We were a part of USDA back until 1975. And it, it's an interesting point to make because that was an inflection point in financial markets which drove um, the agency to be spun out of USDA and become independent almost 50 years ago. And it feels like we're at an inflection point now. Different products being listed um, that we're not accustomed to uh, typically seeing on our markets. Uh, but derivatives regulator, um, financial contracts that, you know, their value is derived from underlying commodities, anything from corn, wheat, and soybeans to natural gas and crude oil. I think my mic's going out yeah. a little bit. Um, uh, to, to, you know, palladium, gold, silver, and other metals. So, and then financial contracts as well. These are hedging tools. Most of our, our market participants are institutional investors trying to hedge risk, whether it's credit risk, rate risk. Um, or foreign currency risk. Uh, we do have a fair amount of, of retail participants in our market, uh, but we're certainly seeing that grow. Um, with respect to crypto, uh, I'd like to thank, and you know, Don was with us uh, for the number of years in the past that uh, we've seen this the emerging market um, evolve over the past, I would say, five years. But we've seen crypto futures, uh, Bitcoin and Ether more specifically, since 2017. And then we're starting to see a lot of native crypto firms buy through sort of M&A activity, um, CFTC licensed exchanges and clearinghouses. And I think this is a clear signal, you know, that there's uh, obviously a demand and a desire for futures products, for even swaps products, which are a type of derivative, so that um, individuals can get exposure to, uh, to crypto products or to risk manage essentially price volatility and use it as a store of value. Um, it's becoming an asset that I think a lot of institutional investors are seeing as favorable and wanting to participate in. So, yeah. 
All right, apologies about that mic there. I don't know if there's a chance that we could just sort that out. But um, can Mr. Stump, that he, did he answer the question? Right? I, did, I don't have any corrections. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I think Chairman Benham's right. We are at this inflection point. It's very exciting. Um, so I recently left the CFTC. So I, um, I was there when we began to see this interest in um, the crypto industry wanting to seek out regulation um, to, you know, I think legitimize what they were doing and, and encourage people that it was well regulated and it was um, uh, something that they could feel safe about engaging in. And I think we were um, really fortunate that we had a really good dialogue with many people. Like, you, like Chairman Benham said, the CFTC regulates futures and swaps but people want the CFTC to do more. And I think the CFTC is um, you know, the best kept secret in Washington, DC. It, it functions, in my humble opinion, better than some other regulatory agencies. And I think that we should be very proud of that. And um, <laughs> I think that it's really good that people want to have the CFTC involved in their business. And, and I look forward to seeing how it all plays CFTC out. CFTC fans in the audience. I love yeah, it. This is like, I, I didn't know that there'd be actually sort of CFTC groupies. Look at this. <laughs> I'm a all fan right. too. I don't work there this anymore. Is, uh, so I'm just, um, I'm the president of the fan club. You really are. This is amazing. Yeah. So that was, that's a pretty good segue here, Chairman Benham, because uh, Commissioner Stump mentioned that uh, some people want the CFTC to do more. And of course, we've just seen a bill introduced yeah. by uh, Senators Kirsten Gillibrand and, and uh, Cynthia Lummis, um, really trying to sort of give, I think, greater weight to the CFTC in its oversight of crypto cryptocurrencies and this technology, and specifically to take it into cash markets, which seems like a, a fairly big departure. Um, you know, is that what you guys want? Are you looking for more authority? Is this uh, is this, and explain if it is why you think that's the, the right way to go. Yeah, you know, I think from my position, it's, it's not necessarily looking for more authority. It's about what my responsibility is as a regulator. And I know, you know, Dawn shares this in, in, the, in, her, in her role as a commissioner before she left. We have a growing market, an emerging market that has um, a lot of risk. It has a lot of volatility. Um, it has a lot of promise in, in many respects. but. From a market regulator's perspective, as we've seen trading platforms develop over the past decade or so, we've seen a demand from retail and institutional clients <coughs> to want to get exposure to trade these products. You know, I, when I see these platforms, these trading platforms, I, I see many of the same characteristics we do in our regulated markets, whether it's the largest futures exchanges or even some of the swaps or options platforms. So yes, it is a departure, and I think that's the right word. We are, as I said, and Don uh, confirmed, we are derivatives regulator, right? We don't regulate cash transactions in agricultural products or energy products or metals products. But I have said this many times, this market that we're seeing emerge and continue to grow, notwithstanding some ups and downs, um, is retail oriented and is highly speculative. The traditional commodity markets are naturally wholesale markets where you have wholesalers, whether you know, it, it's a grain elevator or a commercial end user um, buying and selling large quantities of, of, of commodities or a commodity. This is very different, right? This is a retail-oriented market that's highly speculative. And, and ultimately, it's about using the infrastructure that we have in Washington, which is fantastic, which is uh, you know, filled with experts who understand markets, who understand how markets work, and you know, from a CFTC's pers perspective, understand how commodities work. So as we see these coins develop and change and come and go, um, you know, I think it's important, and this is what I think the, uh, the Lummis Gillibrand bill does well, at least as a starting point, is to start to draw lines around which coins are commodities, which coins are securities. And I've argued, I argued this yesterday um, after uh, an event or during an event that for those that are commodities, notwithstanding the fact that we are historically a derivatives regulator, I think it's important to use that infrastructure. We don't have to reinvent the wheel here and provide additional authority to the CFTC so that we could regulate cash digital commodities. Um, and just leveraging the experience we have, leveraging the exper uh, expertise we have, obviously both on the commodity side, but more importantly on the market side and using that expertise so that we can build that framework of a central limit order book or an exchange and making sure we have pre-trade transparency and eliminating conflicts of interest and having 
post-trade reporting and information flow so that we know there's a level playing field and everyone can get the exposure and information okay. that they need. Just to make sure that message is loud and clear, we're getting an echo sending that to Washington to make sure that it's heard, not once, but twice. So there you go. <laughs> uh, and and I, just wanted to, I wanted to jump in here for a second because I think the legislation, so Chairman Benham and I both worked on Capitol Hill for a while too, so we worked on legislation and we know that this bill is probably not gonna end up looking exactly like it does today when it's ultimately finished, but I think it's really remarkable that they've put together a comprehensive, and it's super comprehensive, it deals with taxes, it deals with commodities and securities, and it's so important to have this bill start the conversation, because I think what everybody's really hungry for is some clarity, and you know, we at the CFTC, when I was there, there was so much confusion. People just assumed that we regulated the cash commodity because we were the Commodity Futures Trading Commission and we often had to say, yeah, no, we don't even have authority to regulate that cash, like the actual physical Bitcoin. That we don't, the CFTC doesn't have the authority to do that. Um, the SEC, mm -hmm. uh, some at the SEC believe they might have the authority, their, their authority might be a little broader. I think it's questionable as to whether or not the the Howey test that the SEC applies is a good fit. And I think that's where we are today. Mm. The current authorization that these agencies have is not a perfect fit for what we're trying to do. So we need legislation to clarify who should be doing what. And, and not to, a lot of people ask me, oh, you, you guys are always having this fight with the SEC. I don't think we have a fight with the SEC. I don't think we ever had a fight with the SEC. We have a great, the CFTC has a great relationship with the SEC, but we're always trying to take a statute that was designed years ago for things like oil and, um, interest rate swaps or um, corn or cattle. And sometimes our, the CFTC's authorizing statute is flexible enough that we can make it work for things like Bitcoin futures, but it doesn't work for cash Bitcoin. So we need to clarify, we need Congress to provide some more clarity as to, and I think everybody here is probably hungry for that because everybody wants answers. I yeah. think the industry would like to be operating in a well-regulated space but there's a lot of murkiness with regard to who's doing what. And um, I told Chairman Benham I might bring this up. I think sometimes the CFTC creates its own murkiness by not clarifying that we bring a lot of enforcement cases that are relative to the actual cash Bitcoin. And that's very important for us to do. I vote for all, I voted for many of those. The CFTC can bring enforcement actions to make sure there isn't fraud occurring in the actual physical asset space because that fraud affects the futures markets that the CFTC has primary responsibility to oversee. But in doing so, I think the public was a little confused as to, well, they bring these cases, you know, enforcement cases, but they must be regulating. And I never wanted the public to have a false sense of security that the CFTC was out there regulating these cash physical assets because we just don't have, the CFTC doesn't have the authority so, today. Yeah, so you're touching on, a, on an issue that comes up quite a bit and that is that certainly the SEC and the CFTC's participation in some of those enforcement actions is criticized for being, you know, using enforcement as the means of establishing regulation. And in the midst of all this clarity, I mean, people talk about, you know, we're still using a 1933 act to determine securities that uh, you know, essentially it's, it's, it's act of, of regulating by enforcement and sort of creating the expectation around that. But we hear a lot about a lack of clarity. Now, uh, Chairman Gensler from the SEC says, no, not at all, it's absolutely clear. And he'll say things like, you know, every single token essentially is a security. Uh, there are people who would say that that is not necessarily well defined. So what needs to happen in your mind, and I'm gonna to go to you first, Commissioner, um, to establish that clarity? What exactly needs to be in place in terms of legislation so that we know what the rules of the road are? Well, I think when we talk about the cash space, 
there's going to have to be a distinguishing definition. And the de definition that seems to be coming up frequently is this distinction between commodity and security. I have in the past criticized that distinction under our existing authorities because I thought it was a little misleading. But in the context of who's going to regulate the cash market, I do think that distinguishing definition has to be established by Congress. Commodities, securities, who's doing what? And sometimes they can morph from being a security to being something else. And I think, I haven't read the legislation in any great detail, but I think it should, they should be commended. As I understand it, they provide a path for how you might morph into something else and how you might need to be regulated by a different regulator if that occurs. And, and I think that's a really good point. Like we, the CFTC works with the SEC on a number of things. Um, I was on Capitol Hill when Dodd-Frank was written and there were lots of conversations about who was going to regulate what part of the OTC swap market. And the CFTC and the SEC as the market regulators were both under consideration. And there were really difficult conversations about who should regulate which piece of that. So it can be done. It, it is not impossible. It just requires everybody rolling up their sleeves. And to your point, I believe we will all be better served if we write some rules, we have some clarifying, uh, we clarify what the expectations are in advance of, of continuing down this enforcement path. Now, where fraud manipulation are concerned, the CFTC should do that all day, every day. I, I would never minimize that. But I do think to the extent there are enforcement cases relative to failures to register with the CFTC or failures to be regulated by the CFTC, I do think the regulator owes the marketplace a little more clarity before we continue down that path. But. So uh, Don and I have, okay, you guys really want to hear me. Thank you. All right. Um, Don and I disagree on this a bit, and we have, you know, when we were both at the commission and we talked about this a fair amount. I, I, I think in principle agree that we have to be very careful about um, uh, how we push enforcement. We don't certainly want to set uh, policy by enforcement, but, you know, I think this is where we disagree. You know, the rules are the rules. The law is the law. We implement rules based on the law. And I think there needs to be an expectation that market participants, stakeholders, whether it's your traditional, you know, ag broker or exchange or clearinghouse or an emerging crypto platform or an intermediary in the crypto space that's introducing uh, a client or an end user or a retail customer to uh, a platform. We have to understand what the purpose of the law was, how it was drafted, notwithstanding the obvious fact that the intention decades ago clearly didn't keep in mind or have in mind the idea that a digital asset would evolve and emerge as, as a commodity. But, uh, I, I do think that we have to have an expectation that individuals who are in the market are going to understand and know what the rules of the road are and whether or not they become subject or could become subject to a compliance requirement. I think, and just reiterating what, what Commissioner Stump said, fraud and manipulation, it's a no-brainer. We have that authority, we use it, we've used it a lot in the past five or six years, but the compliance requirements do become a little bit, um, Hello? Okay. Um, they, they become, the area becomes a little bit gray, but I, my expectation, we brought a number of cases in the past six or 12 months, um, and I think the, the information that was out to the stakeholder was clear in terms of what our expectation is when you have a commodity and, and what action or actions you're taking that might affect a customer um, or a registration requirement. I need to be, oh, there we go. Um, so if we, if this goes forward, you know, the bulk of this bill is passed, your authority is expanded, or at least your, your tasks are, um, you're gonna do a lot, a lot more stuff, right? I mean, you've got regulation and enforcement actions. I mean, is the CFTC ready to take this on? Yeah, you know, I was in the bill, um, there's a provision that would authorize the CFTC to implement a user fee. 
Uh, and the user fee is not unique to the to financial regulators. It is unique to the CFTC. I think we're one of the few financial regulators who uh, currently doesn't have a user fee. But essentially, assessing a fee for service, um, and it allows us to essentially do our job and do what the statute applies. So I, I think there is a full understanding that we are, um, if we were to be provided this authority through a, an amended draft of whatever this bill becomes and signed by the president, that we would have a user fee that would help fund us. We would have to staff up. We certainly would need experts in this space. We have a lot of individuals who have learned a lot over the past five or six years, um, and we've recruited some as well. But um, yeah, it's gonna. There's no doubt. It's gonna change the the face uh, in many respects of the agency and what we do. Um, but you know, we're up for the task. And I, I just say this often. You know, I, I said it earlier. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's use ex existing infrastructure that we have within the policy space, the regulatory space. Um, and leverage that. We have to evolve with markets. We have to evolve with technology. Um, we ourselves in Washington shouldn't get uh, too disrupted by um, new technology and new ideas. Like We have to move with this, and I think this is an opportunity for us to leverage our experience and our expertise to help support the market where there is an opportunity, but also to protect customers. Ultimately, that's what we need to do. So, so whether or not you do need to you know, seek appropriations for this, um, there's still a lot of political horse trading that goes on when you're talking about defining the turf uh, for different agencies. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really complicated about the crypto space is just how polarizing it is in Washington, how um, strongly held are the views on either side. Um, and of course, you know, we've just had this rather spectacular collapse of uh, UST, the stable coin connected with, from, produced by Terra Labs. And, you know, there's a lot of concern about what that will do for uh, the, the, the viewpoint of both regulators and the public towards stable coins, and it seems to be adding to, as well as the volatility in crypto, concerns about another regulatory backlash. Um, how do you see this playing out? I mean, what, what is the current environment in crypto markets doing to that debate as it is taking place in, in Washington? I'll take a quick stab and welcome Commissioner Stumps, but in my view and for me personally it just it, it validates what has been said what i've said for the past couple years um we need to put guardrails around the space uh i, I don't want to say that these things can happen they should not happen obviously it was a, a sort of terrific fall in in the price and a lot of people um uh, you know have gotten hurt because of it but this really underlies the the reason why we need um, a regulatory structure around the space and i I'm sure there's many in this audience who might disagree, for sure, but um, I, say, I say this often, in the US, our capital markets and our derivatives markets are the strongest, they're the biggest, they're the deepest and most liquid because of the regulatory structure we have. It is fair, it's transparent, um, there is accountability for bad actors, uh, and there's an understanding, to, to Don's point, about what you're getting into when you participate in these markets, whether it's as a client or whether it's as an intermediary or an exchange or anything else. And I think that, you know, I don't take an opinion often in my capacity about what may or may not emerge from this technology. I don't think that's not my job. You know, my job is to um, enforce the law and to make sure that markets are running well, commodity markets are running well, that we don't have financial stability or market resiliency issues. And certainly when you think about what happened with Terra and the correlate price movements in, you know, obviously Bitcoin and some of the other larger coins, these are the exact issues that have been raised multiple times by myself and my colleagues about, you know, uh, per perhaps uh, impacts that the crypto environment and the crypto e ecosystem can have on traditional finance. And that's what we have to prevent. But Commissioner Stump, I mean, there is always a risk that, that you overregulate. And you know, if we're trying to encourage innovation in this space, this very important developing space, and if the US wants to take leadership in that, um, are we at risk that we could go too far as an overreaction to a lot of these headlines? No, we are, we're always at risk. And I, I think you know, people, I believe, sometimes view the regulators as this um, 
think tank. Regulators are humans, and so there's always this reaction to like the human element when something like Terra happens. And I think at the CFTC, though, because innovation is part of our mission, we have helped promote. We have we we get very uncomfortable a lot of days. I, well, I don't work there anymore, but there are a lot of days that are very uncomfortable at the CFTC, and those are the days that you know as there are five commissioners, those are the days where you have to step back and say, what is my job? My job is to make sure that investors and, and customers are protected, but my job is also to encourage innovation and allow people to invest in the way they choose to do. And, and that's really hard. You know, This is not something that a human likes to, you, investors are free to invest. Investors are free to build wealth in the United States. Investors are free to make mistakes, and that part makes regulators really uncomfortable because when you know people might make a mistake, and they will make mistakes, you so want to help them not to do that. But regulators aren't nannies. They're regulators, and, they're, and you have to let people fail when they need to fail. And, and that's where this balance between innovation and protection, you know, you can permit or you can prohibit. And, Getting the right balance mm. is really hard, and, and anybody who signs up to do Russ's job <laughs> does not. You, you don't. You don't Have sleep every night. Have some sympathy, people. Come on, right? These <laughs> it's are not, uncomfortable. These are not your to enemy. They're human beings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. It's yeah. not. It's not a glorious so, job. So we have. Sadly, just one minute left, because there's so much more we could talk about. But in that short period that we have, I'd just love to get a very quick take from you, uh, Chairman Benjamin, on what this future looks like. Give us the crystal ball. What, where does it all go from here? Well, um, again, I'm not going to opine on the technology. That's not my job. But uh, I do think, and, and this, this goes to what Commissioner Stump said, um, having observed and been around this space in a, in a regulatory capacity since 2017, in a policy capacity even a few years before that, um, you know, it's, it is, I, I am very encouraged by what we saw yesterday with Senator Lummis and Gillibrand's bill. We're going to likely okay. see uh, I don't even know where that's coming from. It's the seat. You nigga. Oh, mine too now. Um, this is the power. Yeah. This is true power. Um, you can speak with two voices. Okay. We're going to see more bills f filed, I think, uh, in Congress in the next couple of weeks or months. And it's just a positive momentum, um, I think, for the technology, for the industry, for the economy. And then from my perspective personally, you know, from a market's perspective, from a market resiliency, and a systemic risk standpoint. Um, it, it, there are unique coalitions getting together on this issue, which is very rare in Washington, where you have a lot in the industry stakeholder position wanting to be regulated in a sensible way. But obviously, those of us who care about regulation from a customer protection standpoint, from a market resiliency standpoint, seeing eye to eye on the possibilities for opportunities, managing those risks, and seeing this technology grow, Michael, to your point, you know, from a U.S. perspective, we want to see the technology stay here. We want to see it develop and evolve, strengthen, create jobs, create growth. And, you know, I use this word, and not lightly, but sort of U.S. supremacy in the sense of economic growth and technology that we've seen for decades. And I think that's an opportunity we have here. All right. On that optimistic note, we'll close it out. Thank you so much, Thanks. Chairman Benham, yeah. Mr. Stump. Thank you for your uh, patience with the technology.